and then Walter Johnson, the assistant coach of the gymnastics team. And here's Tom. We've seen this. I love this photograph of Tom uh, with the javelin. And this is a, in, from the yearbook. That's Tom looking out a window. And it was the new dormitory that had been built when he was here, uh, Massasoit Hall. And more photos of Tom. Now, Tom was very influenced by Coach Vern Cox. He was a very important person in Tom's life. And uh, Vern coached the track and field team here for many years. He, too, was a great athlete. Um, and throughout Tom's time and his trials to make the Olympics, he stayed in contact with Vern. Vern always was a very upbeat, look on the bright side of life kind of coach, which is exactly what he did for Tom through these tough times. And that's his senior photograph. This is Tom dismounting from the flying rings we've mentioned. This event is no longer used in men's gymnastics, fortunately. But that's his dismount. And then these are some other photographs. Here he is uh, in the pre-med club. So you can see he was really active on the campus. And down that front row, and Ann Briley, also one of our, our uh, went on to become a, fish, a physician, is uh, to Tom's left or right. I like this photograph, as I said, of Tom. And just as we finish up, this is Tom when he was on one of the United States teams in their dress uniforms, travel uniforms. But I did want to uh, show you this because Tom has the red circle. Standing behind him is Bill Toomey. And I happened to be on the um, USOC, the United States Olympic Committee, at, serving there also when Bill Toomey was on the committee. And there wasn't a time that we had a meeting that Toomey didn't come over to me with tears in his eyes and say, I know you're Springfield College. He said, I feel so terrible that I denied Tom all those years. And it wasn't until, as we saw in the video earlier, that he accepted and uh, went to see Tom as he was dying. But he, and, that, and this was after Tom's death. And, uh, excuse me, another photo of Tom. Photos of Tom. You can see, and this is Tom, the MD, Tom, the physician, and with his daughter and also with his wife, Sarah, and daughter in the carriage in the Gay Pride uh, in San Francisco. And I think more than anything, Tom was courageous, absolutely <coughs> courageous. And I think this uh, certainly is, was Tom. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. And that was Tom. And I would like to show you about the, also something about Tom's character as a person in individual personal things as well as in his sports. So I'd like you all to raise your right hand now, as high as you can. Good chance to air your pit this morning, you know. <laughs> no, keep that right arm up. Okay, now look around. Raise it a little higher. Everything Do Tom did, he tried the highest. Would you just all raise your hands? This is what I saw. You are, raise your hand as high as you can. It was this. Then I saw when I asked you to go higher. And that's how Tom met life and dealt with life in everything. He was always the one that tried the hardest. And when he was asked the question, did he ever fail in the video, I thought, oh my God, yeah. no. no. <laughs> and uh, certainly Tom was fighting all of the big guys, the big dragons his whole life. Uh, and he did it in a remarkable way. And I happened to love this little cartoon. Um, and this is Herman Jamal. Everyone's so sensitive about how they want to be addressed these days. What do you mean? Well, Mario, should I call you Latin, Hispanic, or Mexican-American? And Jamal, should I call you black, colored, or African-American? And Jamal, this wisdom shows, why not play it safe and refer to both of us as human beings? And I'm so glad that we're at this point at Springfield College that we can share and love greatly and deeply Tom and his legacy and hope that we continue on with this. Um, and there are lots of wonderful stories about Tom sometime. I'd be glad to tell you some of them. Thank you for letting me. Oh, yeah. One last, one little hokey thing left. How do you read this? It's not here. It's not here. I like to read it, opportunity is now here. And it's 
opportunity is here for us to continue to embrace differences and social justice. I thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mimi. That was fantastic. Uh, I'd like to hear also from, from Rick Parr and Phyllis Potnick. Rick, maybe we can start with you. You did not ever meet Tom Waddell, if I'm not mistaken, nope. but you do have a great Never story did. about him, and I wish, hope you will share it with the audience. Well, it starts in 1957. <laughs> um, I was seven years old. My father took a job here, and it was so long ago he could swim in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yep. um, I have vague recollection of Tom as a as a me as a gym rat at the school here, playing in the old field house and, and uh, loving every minute of it. I have recollection of an incredible athlete, but I didn't know him. Um, in 1968, I started school here as a freshman, and it was quite a, quite a false uh, trimester. Uh, Richard Nixon was running for office against Hubert Humphrey, and I was glued to that. The Vietnam War was at its peak, and uh, the 68 Olympics um, were being held. I remember watching as much of it as I could on a, what was then a large TV in uh, Carlisle Foyer of Alumni Hall and seeing Springfield College's own Tom Waddell finishing sixth in the Olympics. And everybody was excited and cheery and happy and over the moon. And he became sort of the poster child for the college about what it ought to be, and I think rightly so, obviously rightly so. And then in 1976, as my old uh, freshman football coach Tom just mentioned, um, Tom Waddell came out as gay in People Magazine. And then suddenly, he sort of dropped off the face of Springfield College. He became, <clears throat> if not exactly a pariah, certainly persona non grata. I came back to work here in 1986, um, 29 years ago, my God, that went quickly. And in my first year here, I remember watching the Dick Schapp <clears throat> um, presentation that you just saw at home, being incredibly touched and moved by it, and felt um, as if I wanted to speak to him. And Amazingly enough, our alumni office had his phone number. So I said, what the hell? And dialed him up, and he answered the phone. And we talked for about a half an hour. And um, we talked about the fact that our daughters were almost exactly the same age and what it was like to watch a child being born, to become a father, to feel this uh, overwhelming sense of uh, responsibility and love and all sorts of good stuff, which you probably all know about. Um, I told him that I would like to put him up for an honorary doctorate. And um, I came off the phone, and I did. I sent his name in to whoever was taking names at the time, back when you could submit a name, and was told that uh, he was not uh, going to be presented with an honorary doctorate. So um, I called him back, which turned out to be just a couple weeks before he died. And we had a very short conversation, um, at which point I told him that he hadn't um, been, wasn't going to be awarded the doctorate. I should also mention, when I called him the first time, he said, oh, you're the first guy who's talked to me in over 10 years from Springfield College, um, other than friends. Um, I said, well, how about that? So I called him and told him he didn't get the degree, uh, the honorary doctorate, and um, hung up the phone. And it was, he was very short of breath, very weak. And I wept when it was over. And um, ah, so the next year, I put him up again and was told, we don't give it to dead people. We don't give posthumous degrees, honorary doctorates. Uh, Jesus, you don't give somebody when they're alive, you don't give them when they're dead. How the hell do you get into this club? You know? <laughs> um, Jesus. So <laughs> then um, Ken Childs, who is somebody who also should honor at some time. Um, yes. He was a remarkably good and decent man who did really good things for this place and um, was the college chaplain. He had this great idea, and he called me and said, how would, how would you like to put on a, um, a memorial service for him, a celebration of his life, which was the first celebration of his life. This is, you know, it was a, so cool. So Dick Schapp came up, um, who was this really world-known uh, writer and uh, TV guy, and uh, so he was there. Uh, Sarah and Jessica came out from California. Tom's longtime partner came out, an entire uh, carload of the most incredibly wonderful, flamboyant gay folks from San Francisco you've ever seen, who are hugging and smiling and laughing and crying with Vern Cox, Ted Dunn, and Frank Walcott, of all people. Um, <laughs> and you know what I mean, right? I know. <laughs> First, I know um, there. And it was just this <laughs> magnificent, wonderful moment that I will never, ever forget um, of uh, joy and pleasure and happiness and um, 
everything else under the sun. His, um, you were there, right. Did you go for his ashes to be scattered? Yes. Out in the Berkshires. Right. Right. With Jessica and the family. Yeah. We all went out there. Yeah. Jane, yeah. my wife was with us. We all went out there. Quite a moment. And so let's flash forward to, to now. When I first started working here, well, among the classes I teach at the graduate level are a counseling practicum class, which usually has about nine people in it. And it's, you talk about personal stuff, and each person gets to be a counselor for some person in the class who's a client. We watch through windows and you know, microanalyze every little detail of how your hands are moving, whatever, all that stuff. And almost always the class works. Almost always. Usually does. And there's a great feeling of sense of belonging and trust that it, it develops in the class. And usually, in, when I first got here, somebody who was gay would eventually say at the end of the term, I, I don't know how to say this to you guys, but um, I'm gay. And there'd be this you know, wonderful acceptance of the people and hugs and kisses and like, okay, you know, I, I love you, you know. This term, back in the fall, there's a guy in the class who's in his mid-30s who just, in the very first class, was talking about my husband. You know, not a, nobody batted an eye, nobody dropped their, nobody, nothing, absolutely nothing. It was just like, I want a tuna fish sandwich, you know? It had nothing, it was just like the most natural thing ever. I thought, damn it, this is, this is like the most radical sea change thing I've ever seen in my life that happened to me anyway, because I've been here 29 years, so damn quickly. I've never seen anything like this before, and I've, it warms my heart to see that people can be people and nobody cares, you know? Right. And that's all I've got to say, so thank you. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful, Rick. One, one last thing. Um, I've been asked to ask if anybody knows that he had any affiliation with Jacob's Pillow. Does anybody know that he did? No? Because I know he, he danced and was involved with that. But okay, we'll find out. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, and we'd like to close this part of the program, although this could just go on for so long because these are such wonderful stories and there are other people here who are going to be around and hopefully will be able to join us for lunch and continue the conversation. I just don't want to crowd out our keynote speaker for Rob Kearney for part three, but I'd like to close it by introducing Phyllis Plotnick, who also never met Tom Waddell. She came here 10 years after the fact. She came in the mid-60s. Uh, graduated in the class of 1969. And I'm going to ask Phyllis to talk about a few things. One is basically her experience of being a student and an athlete and a closeted lesbian at the time, what it was like on this campus. And then to talk about her, how she got started sparking the Dr. Tom Waddell Fund. For those of you who missed the, the very first part of our program. I talked about this as a day of silence, National Day of Silence, and that it also happens, would have been the 18th birthday of Carl Walker Hoover, uh, the then 11-year-old, almost 12, who took his life in early April, six years ago. And Phyllis, with her deep, deep, deep heart, put this together, put the, the experience of that story which she heard about it, got a lot of national press. She lives in Florida. She put that together with her own experience and with Tom Waddell in what I regard as one of the great examples, both of critical thinking, making connections, but also of just living our humanics philosophy in the deepest way possible. So Phyllis, if you could talk about all of that stuff for a few minutes, <laughs> that would be great. Thank you, Marty. You know, it's interesting when you said uh, Phyllis was a closeted lesbian. I've never used that term on, on campus. Uh, I'm an, an activist. I've been involved in a lot of LGBTQ causes, and I've used the word before many, many times. But something happened to me internally when you said that. Because while I was on campus, it was a time when uh, under the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistically a statistical manual regarding mental health. Uh, it was still a perversion. That only changed in 1973. And it wasn't decriminalized until 1986 when the Supreme Court ruled in the case Lawrence versus the state of Texas. So 
the times were very different. And like you said, Rick, the sea change is just unbelievable. While I was here on campus, I was a, a dormitory counselor. I fell in love, and it was the first time I felt true love. I fell in love with a, I guess we called them girls then, a young woman. And we were feeling great shame. We hid everything. Um, we felt also like we were the only people, not only on campus, but probably in the country and in the world that had these feelings. It's hard to believe now. There was a woman uh, in a class ahead of me that was found to be lesbian and she was offered counseling and then the next year she was dismissed from the school. These were those times. The thing that was so hard, I think, and, and why I'm so moved to be here today is that I really lost touch with Springfield College. And it wasn't because I didn't have a wonderful experience here, both as an athlete as, and as a student, but it was because I never felt that I was who I, I was. And that was me, that was me. But the memories were such that they were very profoundly uh, harmful and hurtful to my soul. I learned about Dr. Tom Waddell from a friend of mine who participated in the 1982 games. She was not a Springfield graduate, but she told me about him and I hadn't heard of him. The next time I heard of him was in the uh, magazine. Uh, it wasn't the Triangle, I think it was called the Massasoit then perhaps. And it, it featured uh, stories and articles and just like today, marriages and also obituaries. And in 1987, I saw his name and I saw it associated with wonderful things that he had done, and I remembered that he had started the gay games. But in the obituary, it wasn't mentioned. And then, in 2009, I read about and I heard about on television the tragic suicide of this young boy. who lived just blocks from the college. And I thought that this school, because of what it stands for, might possibly get involved in doing something that might help prevent something like this in the future. Carl Joseph Walker Hoover inspired me, as did Tom Waddell, to write a letter to the college that I expected, you know, that it was going to go out to all, alum, all alumni and all students and all faculty, but that wasn't the route that it was meant to go. I had the great opportunity through Mimi Murray and through Tammy Cadess and some other people I talked with to be directed to the Department of Development and I've worked in the past two years so closely and so gratefully with Scott Berg and with Joe Long and then with Marty Dobrow and Jeff Monceau have helped bring this day together in the form of a celebration of this incredible man's life and also in an endowment that we've all worked hard to start <coughs> that will continue his legacy in the form of programs on diversity, all kinds of diversity whether it be sexual orientation, or age, or race, or ethnicity, or appearance, or ability, that we hope in Tom's name that we will have programs that last in perpetuity that will honor and that will encourage all of what sometimes gets in our way is what we think of as otherness. So it's a wonderful time to be back here, to hear for the first time for me the term lesbian and really claim it not only for myself, which I've done for a long time, but claim it as a Springfield College alumna. 
So it's wonderful to be here.